morning, friends. It's a privilege to be here and and a, to fulfill this great introduction from our pastor, who would certainly take a real life, wouldn't it? So we're giving praise to the Lord for all of his great healing powers and his mercies that he has given to us down through the years. <clears throat> now, I have a few announcements to make. One, we, Brother Woods and Brother Roberson and we want to thank you all for praying for us for a safe trip. Had a wonderful time. Just gone four and a half days, I believe, and back again safely. The Lord did bless us. Now, we are announcing that uh, the brother Grim Snelling, his uh, revival is continuing on up at the, uh, the end of Brigham Avenue at the, in the city here. And this coming Wednesday night, I want to go away tomorrow after a funeral service for one that will announce in a few moments. We'll let you know Wednesday night we want to go in a delegation all up to visit Brother Grimm before he closes his service up there. And we'll try to get the entire church together if we can and go as a delegation to meet to be with Brother Grimm in one of his services. And now this afternoon at, at the Undertaker establishment at uh, Charleston is uh, a Mrs. Calvin that once come to the church here many years ago, 74 years old, left this life yesterday to go to be with the Lord Jesus. And her funeral is to be preached uh, Monday by Reverend Mr. McKinney, used to formerly the pastor of the Methodist Church at, at Port Fulton for many years, which was a personal friend of theirs, and I'm to assist him, uh, Monday at, uh, I believe it's 1.30, at the uh, at the chapel at Charleston, Indiana, and all of the friends of the Calvin family would I know would appreciate now just a little courage or a little handshake for we all know what that is. We who've been down through those valleys ourselves and know what it means to lose a friend, and so we uh, she's laying in the um, in the chapel now at Charleston, Indiana. If you go up this afternoon, my it would be appreciated by the Calvin family, I'm sure. Many of their people come here to the tabernacle yet. I've married, buried, baptized, pretty near their family through. And uh, so Mr. Grayson, it used to be our neighbor right here, is the undertaker up there. And uh, then uh, this tonight, the Lord willing, where we leave off this morning, we'll try to pick up tonight in this great study that we're studying in now. And then... Uh, I think that was the announcements as far as, as I, I know of. And this coming Wednesday night, now we'll announce tonight that we're going up to be with Brother Grimm. And we welcome all the strangers in our gates, and we're happy to have you here this morning and pray that God will exceedingly, abundantly bless you today for this gathering. Amen. Brother Cox has just told me that the public addressing outfit wasn't working too well at the time. Perhaps maybe, according to the weather, a lot of dampness in the speakers there, and they're not too good to begin with, so that may be the cause. As I see a sister sitting here that I know, the sister arguing, right? I would, this is not nice and, uh, and adequate to ask this, but have you heard from Brother Oregon right since he's been over? I am very interested in hearing from him as soon as we can. He's in Switzerland and Germany in a meeting over there with Brother Tommy Hicks and Paul King. If you ever hear, Sister Ruth, you let me know right away, as quick as you can. <clears throat> now, the little tabernacle has no membership, but we have fellowship. Amen. We have no creed but Christ, no law but love, no book but the Bible. That's the only book that we know of, and the only thing that we know is we have as a blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. We have fellowship one with the other. Everybody. I was noticing this morning that some of you people might have heard the brother praying. That was a Catholic. So, or formerly a Catholic. And we have all different types of people come here. Just had the privilege a few moments ago to shake the hand of a Mennonite brother who's sitting in here. And uh, from the Mennonite, from the Methodist, from the Baptist, from the Catholic, or whosoever will, let them come. Amen. And we fellowship together around the blessings of God's Word. Amen. Setting present is Jehovah Witness and different types. 
other people. So different denominations. I used to love, well, I do yet, the West. I love horses and cattle that just raised on a farm, and I, I love it. And we used to have the Roundup, and I'd go with them, and we had a drift fence. I don't know why you Eastern people know what a drift fence is or not. It's when you put the cattle into the, the forest, they have a fence to keep them from drifting, what they call it, come back down to the ranches that eat up the grass where they're raising the grass for the winter feed. And then up in the mountain, they also have drift fences where they separate so many females and male and so forth. It's called a drift fence. But the main drift fence is where the ranger stands when the cattle are going through. And now, I've sat there on many day in my saddle and watched them as the cattle would go through. There was all different kinds of brands went in. There was some called the Diamond, and some of them called the Bar X, and some ours was the Tripod, something like a Boy Scout emblem. The next fellow below it was a turkey track on the horse, and they had all different kinds of brands to, to know their cattle when they drove them out. Now, the ranger wasn't so interested in what brand they had, but here's what the ranger was interested to watch a tag in their ear. Everything that went in there, no matter what brand it was, had to be a thoroughbred Hereford. It could not go in there unless it was a Hereford. It had to be registered stock or it couldn't get through. I think on that day, when the Lord comes, He's not going to pay attention to what brand we're wearing. But we're all born again Christians. That's right. That's the stock of Christ. The blood test is going to prove us. We're all Christians. And if we're going to be that way there, we might as well be that way here. Don't you think so? So that's why we appreciate all fellowship from all different churches. Now we're studying in this blessed book of Hebrews. One brother has enjoyed it so much till he's taken the tapes and he's making a book of lectures on this. Now we're going to come pretty soon to the 11th chapter. We expect to spend the winter on that. Amen. On the 11th chapter, for each one of those characters, we wish to go back through the book and tie the entire Scripture together. I was going to do it. I do and potion on some of this, of these former chapters. To get the whole book tied together. Amen. For you see, Scripture must prove Scripture. Therefore, if there's any contradiction that anyone would think that the Scriptures contradict each other, that's an error. There's no Scripture contradicts the Scripture. The, the contradiction is where that maybe it contradicts our way of looking at it. But it doesn't contradict itself. Amen. I've been in ministry going in 26 years now. And I have never one time found one thing in the Bible that contradict anything else that's written in the Bible. Amen. And I, I just know it isn't there. And today, we are studying in one of the most blessed chapters of the Hebrews. The seventh chapter. Amen. And if there's anyone who doesn't have a Bible and like to follow us, in the readings, we'd be glad to bring you a Bible. If you just raise your hand, I'll have some of the elders. Someone come here and get some. Someone are raising their hands back there. And, um, and if you want a Bible, just um, uh, raise your hand and they'll bring it to you. Now, the only way that a church can be built, the only way that a man can have faith, is not by his denomination, not by his affiliation, but his faith rests not upon the theology of some uh, man's ideas, because it's more or less altogether man. But the only way faith can find its solemn resting place is upon the immovable and unchangeable Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word. That's how it takes. And, uh, and when faith is heard and accepted, it's forever settled. Amen. 
Nothing no more can ever move it, no matter what comes or goes. Nothing can ever change that faith. Think of that. You're anchored, and you no more change for time and eternity. You're anchored forever. For God, by one sacrifice, has perfected forever those that are sanctified, are called. Amen. And faith has such a great place in the Christian, the believer's life, that it can take its stand by the side of a muddy grave or over a casket or a precious baby or a sweetheart has passed from this life to the beyond and with a stern look of the eagle eye can look to him who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And they forget the things that's in the past. They press on to the mark of the high calling. I'm so glad that God has provided such. And has made it a free gift to all. That's what churches are to be. Churches doesn't mean denominations or organizations. It means groups of people, of believers, who's gathered together under the fellowship of the Word. And in this marvelous teaching here of St. Paul, in the backgrounds, in the former chapters, he has specifically been dealing with the supreme deity of the Lord Jesus and who he was. Christ was God made so that man could feel him and touch him and, and fellowship with him. Christ, the Lord Jesus, was the body that God dwelt in. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. 1 Timothy 3.16 Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, for God was manifested in flesh. The great Jehovah came down and was made tangible by living in the body of his own son, declaring and reconciling the world to himself. God was nothing, Christ was nothing short of God, and, and God was nothing short of Christ. The two together made the Godhead bodily, made a little lower than angels so that he could suffer. Angels cannot suffer. Jesus was the tabernacle that God dwelt in. The Bible said in the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles that tabernacles and burnt sacrifice and burnt offerings thou wouldest not, but a body has thou prepared me. Amen. High be it the most high dwelleth not in tabernacles made with hands, but a body has thou prepared me. That in tabernacling or dwelling, in a fellowship with man. God permits, as soon as we're through with this chapter here, or through with this book, we want to go back and pick up the book of Ruth and show in that and how God became kin folks to us to reconcile the lost back to himself by fellowshipping and becoming one of us. The Redeemer must be kin folks. And the only way that God could become kin folks to us is to become one of us. So he could not become an angel and be kin folks to man. Last evening when I was talking to the heartbroken son, my partner, uh, the mother that's just passed away, said, oh, Brother Bill, I guess she's an angel tonight. I said, no, Earl, she'll never be an angel. She's a woman tonight. Just as God made her and will always be. Never an angel. God made angels. He never made man to become angels. He made angels and man. Amen. So man will never be angels and angels will never be man. God made them. Different. 
Now, and in Christ, becoming flesh to redeem out of that great beyond where man had fell in that immortality by sin had come down. God came down and taken on the form or the shape of a man and became kinfolks to us that he might bear our sins and our death. And in one of the illustrations we were giving in the previous lessons, just a little background so the newcomer would understand, God on his road up to Calvary as the sting of death was upon him and was buzzing around him and finally it stung him till he died. He died till the sun quit shining. He died until the moon and the stars would not give their light. Well, how he had to do that? To anchor the stinger of death. If he had been an immortal person, if he'd been in the theosophy or been in the spirit, death has no control of that. It had to become flesh that he could take the stinger of death. But when a bee or an insect who stings, once stings deep, he'll never sting again. He leaves a stinger in the flesh. That's what Christ be, or God became. Christ dwelt in flesh that he might anchor in his own flesh the stinger of death. And when death pulled away from him at the cross, it left its stinger. It cannot sting a believer anymore. It can make a humming noise. It can make a buzz and a threat. But it cannot sting. It has no stinger. The great St. Paul on his death march screamed and said, Oh, death, where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who's done give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. For both death and grave has lost its power. Amen. Now, then last Sunday we taken leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. In the sixth chapter, we read this. Let us go on to perfection. And we found out that the people today in many churches along with the Branham Tabernacle and different ones, we lay too much on studying about the principles of Christ. He was the son of Abraham. He was the son of, of uh, so-and-so. And all back the genealogies. But the Bible said, let us lay aside those things and go on to perfection. First, you must know the doctrine. And then you must know all these things. Then let's lay them aside. He said of resurrection of the dead, laying on of hands, baptisms, and all those dead articles of God, yet they, they have no life in them. But the church today just goes to those things. Oh, we believe in the deity of Christ. Yes, sure. We believe in water baptism. Yes, sure. Laying on of hands, Paul said, we'll do all this if God permits. But... In the face of all of that, let's lay it aside now and go on to perfection. Now, the church cannot be perfected through organizations. Amen. It gets further away from God all the time or farther away from each other. Amen. We draw barriers. We separate ourselves, seemingly not having the faith. But then when we leave those principles of doctrine, if we move on to perfection, then those little things become of not much use. We go into a relationship and we find out that the only way that we can be perfected is to be in Christ. Amen. And we find out then by the teachings of the Bible that how we get into Christ, not by water baptism, not by laying on of hands, not by teaching, but by one spirit. Amen. We are all baptized into one body and become perfected through his suffering. Then we look different, we think different, we act different, we live different. Not because it's a duty or we belong to church, but because of the love that God has shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that makes us fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. 
then there's no denomination or barriers in that. Amen. We're all one great body. Amen. Now we're ready to enter in upon the morning lesson in a few moments. One more thing I'd like to get to here. That is that Paul speaking in the book of the seventh cha- uh, the sixth chapter, we find out here that we're made perfect in Christ. Then in the thirteenth verse of the sixth chapter, just a little background. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. God swore by himself because he could not swear by anyone greater. Now we want to go back. Let's get to Galatians just a few moments. Turn back to the book of Galatians and get Galatians 3.16. And we'll read here just a moment of what he swore by. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promise made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one to the seed which is Christ. Now if you'll notice reading that close, I should read. To Abraham and his seed, Sangler, were the promises, plural, made. Abraham and his seed. Now the seed of Abraham was one which was Christ and prefigure Isaac. But Abraham had many children. He had one before he had Isaac, which was showing the slipping up of the unbelief of Sarah who wanted Hannah to bring the child thinking that she was too old and God to bypass and make some other way from the way that he had promised to do it. But God keeps His promise. No matter how unreasonable it may seem, God's obligated to His promise. And Sarah thought that maybe she could have uh, Hannah, or Hagar rather, her maid to give birth to a baby through Abraham, and she would take it. And that became Ishmael, which was a thorn in the flesh from then until now. Still a thorn in the flesh. Now there come the Arabs. And they've always been that way. Now any time that you disbelieve the naked word of God and adopt some other way, it'll be a thorn in your flesh from there on. You take just what God said. If he said it, that's just what he means. Oh, blessed be his name. Just take his word. No matter what tries to bypass, say, well, it really doesn't mean that. It means just what it said when God makes the promise. Now, if we'll notice closely, Abraham and his seed were the promises. One was the seed, singular, and the other was promises. There's more than one promise and more than one person that's included in the seed of Abraham. See, there's one seed, but many people of this seed. See, there were not just Abraham alone or to Isaac alone, but uh, it was to all the seed of Abraham, the promises was made to each and every individual seed of that seed. You get it? Therefore, we being dead in Christ, according to the scriptures, we take on Abraham's seed and are... Heirs according to the promise, not by joining church or farming of the dead articles or, or so forth, but by being born of the Spirit of Christ, we are Abraham's seed and are joint heirs with him Amen. in the kingdom. Then we go on to read then, just a little further now, God making an oath, now the 17th verse of the 6th chapter, wherein God willing more abundantly, God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it with an oath. Oh, let's just rest now a few minutes. God more willing, not that he had to, but to make this a sure thing. Now, we've already found that God became flesh 
dwelt among us, how did he manifest his self towards the world? When he found the woman in adultery, he said, I don't, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. When he found the sick, he acted just the way he'd have to act. For he was God and he, he healed the sick. He raised the dead. He forgave the sins. No matter how they was and how many and how backslidden, he forgave them anyhow if they were willing to come and ask. Now, notice, if God acted any one time on a certain circumstance, and if that same circumstance arise again, he's got to act the second time like he did the first time, or he's unjust. Amen. See? Amen. No matter how bad you are in sin, how stupid you may become, He's got to act to you like he did that fallen woman or he acted wrong then. God's behavior is his person and what he is in his behavior declares his person. And that's the way you are. In your behavior of life tells what you are. As we had went through a lesson or two ago, the Methodist people wanted to declare it. When you shout, you got it. The Pentecostal says when you spoke with tongues, you got it. The shaker said when you shake, you got it. The Pennsylvania shakers. And we find out that they're all wrong. Your life declares it. Your person declares what you are. A man is known by his works. And whatever your life is, You've heard the old story. Your life speaks so loud I can't hear your words. Amen. So whatever you are, you are the life that you live shows what kind of a spirit is in you. Amen. And then you may impersonate the wrong thing or impersonate the right thing, may I say. You may impersonate a Christian, but there will by and by come a time when the strain will be put on, then it will show what you are. Amen. A chain is its strongest at its weakest link. When Christ, the Son of God, was put to the test, Amen. it showed what he was. Amen. Sure, when you're put to the test, it'll prove what you are. Your life always reflects what's on the inside of you. By and by, be sure your sins don't find you out. That's what we're trying to say. Jesus said in St. John 5, 24, He that heareth, not he that shaketh, he that speaketh, he that, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life Amen. and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death unto life. It's your faith. And your faith confessed by your lips. Make manifest to the people that can hear. But your life is open before all. So no matter how much you try to act this and do this, it'll never work. It's got to be in you. That's the real kernel of the whole story. Your personal faith in the resurrected Christ as your Savior, that He's at the right hand of God acting in your place this morning as you're acting in His place down here as a witness. Amen. A witness is to act instead of somebody. Stand for you as a witness. And as your life reflects here, what your testimony is in Christ, it reflects there and it reflects here. And he is up there as what he is for you reflects both there and here. So you are, by your faith, are you saved and that alone. So sensations, emotions, feelings, anything has no place at all in it. Now, not, now don't think wrong that I do not believe in these emotions. Certainly but what we're on now trying to drill to this people of this day is not emotions. Amen. The devil has tucked those things and went wild with the people. 
letting them base their eternal destination upon an emotion. Shouting, speaking with tongues, going to church every Sunday, acting like a Christian. That won't have one bearing at that day. Except the man is born again. And your life reflects what you are on the inside. See? Not your emotions. You could have blood in your hands. You could speak with tongues. You could heal the sick. You could move mountains with your faith. And you are nothing yet. First Corinthians 13. See? It's got to be something happened by birth which comes from God. And God brings a new birth into you and gives you a part of Himself. Then those things are. You are a new creation. I give unto them eternal. We went through the word eternal. Forever is a space of time. Eternity is forever. Forever and forever. But there's only one eternity. And we find out that you receive eternal life. And the word in the Greek is zoe, which means God's life. And you receive part of God's life, which makes you a spiritual son of God. And you're just as everlasting as God is everlasting. You have no end, no place to stop because you have no place to begin. Anything has a beginning has an end. And that without a beginning has no end. How we love that precious word. Amen. How the Christian should be established Amen. in the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Amen. And not be tossed about place to place and joining different churches. Any church you want to belong to is all right as long as you're a Christian. But first, but the first thing. Which is that birth that makes you kinfolks to God as God became kinfolks with you. He became kinfolks that He might raise you up. Before He can raise you up, He has to give you eternal life. Amen. Then God had become kinfolks to take death to raise you up. Then you had become kinfolks to Him in order to go in the resurrection. Amen. You see what it is? It's just a swap. God became you that you might become God. See? Amen. God became a part of you, flesh. That you might, by His grace, become a part of Him. That's all to have eternal life. Just a beautiful picture. And all we love it. Now, God willing more abundantly. Didn't have to. But He was willing to. I'm so glad of that, aren't you? That our God is willing. Look, what if He he was long-suffering? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, faith, peace, long-suffering. That's a part of God that's in you. And can forbearance, forbearing one another's burdens, forgiving one another, as God for Christ's sake forgive you. The Spirit of God in you makes you that way. And then when God was here on earth and became you, became sin. That Him taking your sin bore for you and paid your penalty for it. God is long-suffering, forbearing our burdens. And then He's a good God. Amen. If you want to certain things your way, you know, God's good enough to do that. Amen. He loves to, to make you happy. He wants to... He's love. And His great love constrains Him to even step down sometimes to let you have the things that you want. Amen. Look at Thomas after the resurrection. Thomas wouldn't believe. Oh, he's got many children today. But Thomas said, no, no, I'll have to have some evidence. I'll have to put my hands in his side and in this, my fingers over here in his hands before I will believe it. I, I don't care what you say. See, he was all out of the Scripture order right then. You're supposed to believe it. So he said, I have to have some sort of evidence to prove it. And Jesus appeared. He's good. Come on, Thomas. If that's what you want, well, here you are. You can have it. That's the way we always say, Lord, i got to speak with tongues. i, I got to shout. i got, oh, go ahead. I'll let you have it. 
He's good. So he stuck his hands in his side. Then he said, Oh, it's my Lord and my God. He said, Now, Thomas, you believe since you've seen. But Amen. how much greater is their reward who has no evidence Amen. and yet believes it? Amen. Very hard. That's where we must get to. How much greater is their reward who's seen nothing but yet believe it? It's an act of faith that we accept it. Now, I believe signs following the believers, but let's put first things first. You're going to have the signs without this. Paul said you could. He said, I can speak with tongue like both man and angels. I'm nothing. I can move mountains by my faith. I'm nothing. I can understand the Bible in such a way I could know all the mysteries of God. I'm nothing. See, that's gifts of the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit is God. God is love. Joy. Amen. Peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, patience. Amen. That's the Spirit of God. That's what God raises up in the last days. Through that Amen. Spirit. Now, not willing, God more willing, abundantly, to show unto the heirs of the promise, God more willing to show the heirs. Who is the heirs? We being dead in Christ, take on Abraham's seed and her heirs. Amen. Oh, does that soak in? Amen. We are heirs Amen. of the kingdom of God through a sworn promise. Amen. God didn't have to swear. His word's perfect. But he swore too. By himself, for there is no one greater. As we read on just a moment, listen. The promise of the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. The immutability, the unchangeable. Amen. God cannot change. He has to remain the same. And if God heal one sick person, he can never change his attitude. God forgive one sinner, one prostitute. He can never change his attitude. The immutability, the unchanging of God's word. God said in one place, I'm the Lord who heals all our diseases. He has to stay with it. Amen. For he's infant. He knows the end from the beginning. Now I can say, I'll do this. And the Bible said we ought to say, if the Lord is willing. Because I'm a mortal. I don't know. Sometimes I have to take my word back, but God can't take his back. Amen. He's God. And he only requested one thing. If thou canst believe. Amen. Oh, my. Lord. If you can't believe, all things are possible. Amen. If thou canst believe. That's all you. If you can, there's a question. But not the question is on God's word. Because his immutability, he cannot change. How wonderful. Now listen as we read on down. That by two immutable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie. Impossible and impossibility and immutability is practically the same word. Amen. Can't change, can't move, has to stay the same forever. Can't be changed. The immutability... And the impossibility, and two by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. We have two things, yes. First, His Word said He would do it. The second was His sworn oath on it He'd do it. Amen. Oh, my. Amen. What type of people should we be? Why should we be tossed about and run about and taking the things of the world and acting like this 1957 Streamline model Christianity. We want to be the old-fashioned type that takes God at His word and calls those things which were not as though they were if God said so. Amen. That Amen. settles it. Abraham, who the promise is given to him and his seed, he called the things which were not as though they were. For it was God's promise knowing that God could not lie. He promised him that. And he believed it. As the years passed by, and the promise seemed to get further away to the natural eye, it became closer to Abraham.
Abraham. And instead of being weak and say, well, maybe there is no such a thing as divine healing. Maybe I'm just going Maybe there is no such a thing. Maybe I've been wrong in all my conceptions. Then that shows one thing that you haven't been born again. Amen. For it's, we got to last Sunday, just a little further back in the chapter, for it is impossible Amen. for a man that's once tasted the heavenly gifts and things to fall away again to renew himself to repentance. Amen. Absolutely, totally impossible. For he that is born of God does not and cannot commit sin. Amen. For the seed of God remains in him and he cannot sin. The seed of God is the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word. The sacrifice is made, it's all over. Amen. Now if you do wrong, God will make you pay for it. But if you do you wrong, you don't do it willingly. 10th chapter, 47th verse of me. For if we sin willfully, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, but after you're once born, you have the truth, not the knowledge of it, but you have accepted the truth. And it's become a reality. And you're a child of God for time and eternity. Amen. God swore that he would do it. Jesus said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. He'll never come to the judgment. He's passed from death unto life. Amen. Wow. Now with an oath like that, God willing that we should receive it. Now watch what he says here, Paul, speaking to the, the church. Is it possible for God to lie? We ought to have a strong consolation. Wow. Not, well, if the Baptists don't treat me right, I'll go to the Methodists, see? We should have a strong consolation who has fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Amen. Now in the reading of the last, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. The hope, the sworn oath of God, we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which Entereth into that is within the veil. Let's speak just a moment on the veil. We didn't get it too good last Sunday night. In the veil. The veil is the flesh. The veil is what keeps us from seeing God face to face in this church. Amen. The veil is what keeps us from seeing the angels at their positions this morning, standing by the seats. The veil is what keeps us from seeing Him. We're hid behind the veil, and that veil is the flesh. We are sons and daughters of God. We're in the presence of God. The angels of God are encamped about those who fear Him. We're in the presence of God all the time. I'll never leave thee, neither will I ever forsake thee. I'll be with thee always, even unto the end. But the veil is the flesh. That's what keeps us out of His presence. But to the soul, the spirit, by our faith, we know that he's watching us. Yes, he's standing by us. He's here now. Down at Dolphin one morning, an old prophet was surrounded by an army. And the, his servant went out and said, Oh, Father, the whole country surrounded by the aliens. And Elijah raised up and said, Why, son? There's more with us than there is with them. Amen. Well, he batted his eyes and looked around. He could see nothing. He said, God, I would that you'd open his eyes. Amen. Take away the veil. Yes. And when the veil dropped from over his eyes, around that old prophet was chariots of fire. The mountains was on fire with angels and chariots. Amen. There you are. Oh, then Gehazi could say, I, I understand now. See, the veil dropped. There's where the hindrance. Here it is. Hold tight. The veil is what keeps us from living the way we should. Amen. Veil is what keeps us from doing the things that we really want to do. Amen. And God became veiled in flesh. And the veil was torn in two. And God became God again. And he raised up the veil that he hid himself in. That's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 
proving to us that in this veil that we're now hid in, by faith we believe it and accept it. And when this veil is torn to all go in his presence, what this assures knowing that I know him in the power of his resurrection at the coming of the Lord Jesus, this veil will be raised up again Amen. in a perfected way till I'll walk and talk with him as my Savior and my God when he takes the throne of David and we'll live forever. Amen. In this veil, after it's been perfected, but this veil has sin in it. It was, don't matter how, don't ever think of that glorified body in this earth. It's got to die the same as your soul has to die to be born again. Amen. In the perfection, not eating meats and doing this and perfecting the body, you'll never have it. And you've got to quit this and do this and do this and do this. That's law. That's legalist. We don't believe in the legal forms of salvation. We believe it by grace are we saved. Amen. And it's not you. You had nothing to do with it. It's God's election that does it. No man can come to me except my Father draws him. Amen. That's right. And he all Jesus come to do was to get these that the Father foreknew and predestinated them before the foundation of the world to become sons and daughters of God. Amen. Amen. Not him that runneth or him that willeth, but God that showeth mercy. Amen. God that does it. You can't brag at all or not a thing that you did. God by grace saved you. Amen. Not you yourself. If you do, you've got something to brag about. But you have nothing to brag. All praises goes to him. Amen. Him, then he's giving this sure hope, swore by an oath, the impossibility for his children to ever be lost. Now they get witness for doing wrong. You reap what you sow. You get that? Don't think now you're just going out and sin. Get by with it. If you do and got that attitude, it shows you've never been born again. You get it? If you still got the desire in you to do the wrong, then you're still wrong. See, for he has perfected forever those that are... And those beasts under the Old Testament are in the legal days, offered yearly, continually, can never take away sin. But when we put our hands upon his head and confess our sins and are born again of the Spirit of God, we have no more desire of sin. Sin is passed from you. That's for time and eternity. You'll make mistakes. You'll fall. You willfully do wrong. You go out sometime and do things. That don't mean that you're lost. That means that you're going to get correction. My little boy, lots of times, my children, I'll do things. Your does too. That you, they know that's against your your rules, and they know what to expect when they do it. They're going to get a whipping for it. Sometimes a good one, but it's still your child. Certainly. It's impossible for that man to ever be gone again. That's once been born of eternal life. God's not an Indian giver. He that heareth my words and believeth on him and sent me has everlasting life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death unto life. Amen. I'll raise him up at the last days. That's God's promise. Now, if you go on and say, oh, well, then I do just, I always do what I want to do. But if you're a Christian, you don't want to do the thing that's wrong. Amen. Cause the very life in you, the very foundation. If you want to do wrong, it shows the wrong things in here. Amen. How can bitter and sweet water come from the same fountain? So if you've been all mixed up on some kind of emotion or fabulous something, another sensation, forget it. Go back to the altar and say, God, take my whole sinful life away. Amen. And put me in such a condition that my whole desire, he that's born of God, does not commit sin. Amen. That's right, he has no desire to do so. Certainly the devil will trap him here and there, but not willfully. The Bible said so. The devil will trap him now and then. Sure he will. He tried to throw traps to our Lord Jesus. He did to Moses and caught him. He did to Peter and caught him. He did to many, but Peter even denied him. But then he went and wept bitterly. There was something in him. When the dove was turned out of the ark, the crow went out. He called around. He was in the ark all right. But when he went out, his nature was different. He could eat all the old dead carcasses he wanted to and be satisfied. Why, he was a crow to begin with. He was a scavenger. He was no good. He was a hypocrite. He sat on the roost with the dove just as big as the dove was. He 
could fly anywhere the dove could fly. But he could eat good food just like the dove eat. And then he could eat rotten food, what the dove couldn't eat. For the dove is a different mix-up. She's a different mate. She's a dove, and the dove cannot digest rotten food because it don't have any gall. And a man that's born of the Spirit of God becomes a dove of God. His nature, his change, his makeup. Yes, sir. You put the spirit of the of the dove in the crow, he'll never sit on a dead carcass. If he lay down by mistake, he's trying to get away quick. He couldn't stand it. And a man that's born to the Spirit of God don't intolerate. He might light in a bar room sometime, but he'll get out of there quick. A woman might entice him, get him turned around, but he'll turn his head again. You get away from there quick. Why? He's a dove. Try it. You ain't going to fool him. Because that he knows my sheep know my voice. Amen. And a stranger they will not follow. Amen. He's a dove to begin with. That's what I'm speaking about. That actual something anchors in there. Watch close now God swore. Boy, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both steadfast. And which entereth into, into that which is the veil. The veil. God came down veiled in flesh to do what? To show himself. He had to hide because we couldn't see him. And he hid behind the veil. And the veil was who? Jesus. Amen. Not me that doeth the works, my father, said Jesus. My father dwelleth in me. I work, the father worketh and I worketh the other two. Here he is as the veiled one walking in the flesh. God Emmanuel, God with us. God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself. Here he is walking around. Now, he came down and made a sanctification or provision or propitiation that through his death offered, paid the price of sin, that he might come back and dwell in us. Amen. Then the faith that we have is a, is a veiled Faith or a veiled person. Amen. Therefore, we don't look at the things we see in this veil. The veil has educations and it does things and speaks things. It's a scientific thing. But the spirit of the living God that dwells in here calls those things which were not as though they were, if God said so. There's your veiling. We're in the veil. Now, someday he'll raise this veil up, not born of a woman. By the sex desire of man and woman, but by the will of God, he'll speak and she'll come to pass. Amen. Then we'll have a body like his own glorious body. We'll be veiled so we can talk to one another, shake one another's hands. Amen. Now when we go from here, there's a tabernacle, a theostomy. This an image of a man that don't eat, don't drink, don't sleep, wait forever. That's where we go to. But they're waiting under the altar crying, Lord, how long, how long? To come back down because they want to shake hands with one another. They want to sit down and eat and talk to one another. Amen. They're human. Blessed be he the name of the Lord. When God made man in his own image at the beginning, he made him thus. Amen. He fellowship with one another because we know one another. We like the things that God made us because we were made thus. And in his great coming, those who are ready will be thus forever. Yeah. Amen. Immortal will stand in his likeness. Oh, blessed be that name of Christ. Amen. And now we have the earnest of our salvation as we accept Him as our personal Savior, as our healer. All these are the remunerations. Are the dividends that's paid on the insurance policy. Amen. 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 You know what an insurance policy is? You can draw dividends on it until the face value comes. Certainly, you can draw dividends. And we're drawing dividends now. Only the thing, as soon as we draw dividends, the remunerations build up again. An insurance agent one time said to me, Billy, I'd like to say some insurance. I said, I have some. My wife looked around at me. Now, nothing against insurance, but some people are insurance poor. So they turned around and said, my wife looked at me strange. You got insurance? I said, sure. But she didn't know nothing about it. He said, well, Billy, what kind of insurance do you got? I said, blessed assurance. Amen. Jesus is mine. Amen. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Amen. An heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Amen. That's very good, Billy. 
He said, we'll put you up here in the graveyard. I said, it'll take me out. That's the main thing. I'm not worried about getting there. I'm worried about getting out. And since I have the assurance by the sworn God of eternity that he'll raise me up again in the likeness of his son in the last day, I'll walk boldly and have a consolation and an anchor of the soul that while I'm in this veil, there's some unseen something got me anchored against the rock of ages. When the waters jump and flash, it doesn't make any difference if death perils or anything separates us not from the love of God. Amen. My anchor holds within the veil. Let the floods rise at her, dash at if the else come. The born again believer has an anchor. You can't see through this veil yet. But I know my anchor holds the honor against the rock of ages. There's a sworn promise that he'll raise me up the last day. No wonder you look death in the face and say, where is your stain? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're in the forerunner. Oh, my. Amen. We go get the lesson. We're in the forerunner. For us, a forerunner. Did you ever notice in the old western days, many times I've went across the old trails, a forerunner scout. When the wagon train was perishing for water, the scout run ahead, and he seen the tribes of Indians. He bypassed them, and he seen where there was a fountain of water. He rushed back to tell the boss of the wagon train, step up the horses. Everybody take good courage, for just over the mountain, there's a big fountain of water. He's a forerunner. And here... The forerunner. Man was once pinned down by the devil under rapid fire. But somebody tucked a machine gun nest. That was Jesus. The forerunner has gone before us. And Satan's standing there with a machine gun pinning us down. Always in bondage and scared of death. He's guarding that fountain. Sure he was. He's given the commission. Because we'd seen him and drove away from it. But the forerunner, Christ, come in and tuck the nest. <laughs> You've heard that old song, Hold the Fort for I'm Coming. Amen. Hold the fort, nothing, let's take it. <laughs> we don't want to hold it any longer. Amen. Christ, tuck the fort. Hallelujah, the door's open. Amen. There's a fountain open in the house of God in the city of David for the clean, for cleansiness of the unclean. Amen. Our forerunner's done entered in for us. The forerunner, he tells us, there's a place just beyond the honor where you'll never get old, where there'll be no wrinkles, where you won't have to use Matt Staxters to make you look nice to your husband. The forerunner has one on. There's a, never a place where you get old and weary and shaky. There's a place where you'll never get sick, where the baby will never have a college, where you'll never shed a false or tooth to get a false one. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be his name. He entered in and a marvel will stand in his likeness someday, on earth. The stars and the sun that I shine. Certainly, the forerunner has gone before us. The forerunner is gone as far us entered. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Mel. Hesitate. This great forerunner has gone before us, making a way. He's become from the Spirit, the great fountains of the rainbow of God, who had no beginning or no end. He was forever God. This ray of light went forth. It was a ray of love. That's the main one, red. The next color follows, which was blue, blue the trueness. Next followed after that was other colors, so the seven perfect colors, which is the seven spirits of God. Amen. It went from that great fountain to that great diamond that Jesus spoke of, that great diamond that's shipped to reflect these colors. God was made flesh and dwell among us that he might reflect his goodness and mercy among us by gifts and signs and wonders. That whole big rainbow had become in a theosomy of made in the image like man. Yet he wasn't a man. He didn't have flesh yet. He was a theosomy. Moses said, I'd like to see it. God hit him in the rock, and when he passed by, he turned his back. Moses said, it looked like the back of a man. Then what come to pass? 
One day down there when Abraham was sitting in his tent, we'll get to it tonight, when Abraham was sitting in his tent, God came up to him in a body of flesh. Well, he said, Brother Brown, he was, we'll find him out here meeting Abraham before that in the order of Melchizedek. A body of flesh, which was God. Sure it was. He was God in flesh. You said, then, Brother Bram, why would he have come back and be born? He wasn't born, and he was just created a body that he dwelt in. Melchizedek was a king of Salem, which is a king of Jerusalem, which is a king of peace, which had neither father nor mother, beginning of days or ending of life. Jesus had both father and mother and a beginning of days and ending of life. But he was made out of the order of Melchizedek which had no beginning of days or ending of life. Melchizedek was God himself. Melchizedek was Jehovah God, the same one that met Abraham years later in front of his tent, had his back turned to him and said, Why does Sarah laugh? Amen. That's right. He was the one who stood there looking over towards Sodom. Abraham recognized him because inside of his veil was an anchor holding that promise. Not because he had some sensation, but God made him the promise. And when he come into contact with that great magnet, he knew it was in that flesh. Amen. Walked out with Abraham out there a little piece. He told Abraham, said, seeing that I'll keep these things from Abraham to see that he's the heir of the world. Amen. I just won't do it. So Abraham, I'll tell you what I'm on the road to do. We pick it up tonight. Down there in Sodom, and what was all he was going to do. And as soon as he had blessed Abraham, he went back into space again. Amen. Amen. A man that stood there and had dust on his clothes. A man. And not only that, but he eat the flesh of a calf that Abraham killed and drank in the milk from the cow and eat some whole cake, some cornbread and had butter on it. It's exactly right. And then turned back to a theosophy again. Why was it? Why didn't he take it then? He had never been born like you and I. But he had to be born to in the flesh, so he could hold that stinger. That was a created body. That was a body that he just pulled the calcium and potash out of the earth and said, and stepped into it. That was the same thing Melchizedek was. He stepped into him in a body that he could walk out before him under the veil of a veil of his own creation, not a veil of the creation of a woman, through the womb of a woman, through a, a cell. Never. But he created this and stepped out into it and talked in the order of Melchizedek. Who is this Melchizedek? For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, prince of the most high God, certainly, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, that great love, love that great spirit in the beginning, king of righteousness, after that, king of Salem, which is a king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days or ending of life. Amen. Who was it? Amen. He never was born. He never will die. Amen. <laughs> Who is it? It was God. Amen. Sure it was. In the foreshadow of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Certainly was, but he had to come through a woman in order you come through a woman. And he had to come the way you come in order to bring you back to him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amen. That saved a poor blind wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found by his grace. I was blind, but now I see. I understand what he had to do. God became me that I by grace might become of him. He taken my sins that through his righteousness I might have eternal life. I could not choose myself. My nature was a sinner. I had nothing to do with us. Born to the world, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Not even a chance at all. Nothing. Not even a desire. Tell a pig he's wrong eating slop, will you? See how much he'll listen to you. Tell a crow he's wrong eating on a dead carcass and see what he'll tell you if he could talk. You tend your own business. Certainly. Oh, but the grace of God Amen. that changed this nature and give me the opportunity to desire and to crave and to thirst. Amen. Thy love kindness is better to me than life. Oh, God, my heart will long after thee. David said, as a heart paineth for the water brook, so my soul thirst after thee, oh, God. Amen. God gave man that thirst to worship him. 
to seek after him. But man perverts it by the call of the devil. And he goes and lusts after women and the pleasures and things of the world, trying to satisfy that holy creation that God's put in to love him. He places it up on the things of the world. But brother, when he's once changed in that fountain with wiggle tails in it, all kinds of, of disorders of the sister has been cleansed out and sterilized and the pure water of God is put in there. Sin can never touch it. Amen. 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 Oh, how I love him. How I adore him. My life, my sunshine, my all in all. The great creator became my savior. And all God's fullness dwelleth in him. Down from his glory, the ever-living story, my God and Savior came, and Jesus was his name. Born in a manger to the throne of stranger, the God of sorrow, tears, and agony. Oh, how I love him, how I adore him, my breath, my sunshine, my all in all. God, how could he do it? Man's tried to write it. One said, if we would ink the ocean fill and ever straw on earth a quill, all the skies the parchment made and every man has tried by trade to write the love of God above, how that great God of heaven became flesh and taken my sins the right to love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Amen. Or though the scroll contained the whole, those steps from the sky to sky. And to make the heirs of this salvation a sure hope, he swore by himself that he had raised us up in the last days, Amen. give us eternal life, and no man can pluck him from my hand. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Are you guilty of spurning his love? Have you shunned his blessed being, this great one who made you what you are? And now here you are this morning, this far in life, and has given you an opportunity. Do you want to continue to live? There's only one way to live, that's believe on the Lord Jesus. If you from your heart believe that he's the Son of God and accept him as your Savior... And believe that God raised him up for your justification. If you want to accept it on that basis, it's yours now. Would you raise your hand, some unpenitent soul that would like to repent, repent this morning? Say, remember me, brother preacher, as we go to prayer. I, too, have failed. I've joined church, but I, I know I, I've never had that, what you're talking about. I've never been born to that spirit, brother Brenham. I just, I just haven't got it, that's all. I want you to pray for me that God will give it to me this morning. God bless you, sir. There'll be another say, God, make me what I, you want me to be. I want you to be. I want to be as you want me to be. I've spurred your love. God bless you, son. Just a moment now. If we with the ocean fill and work the sky a part of me where every star on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry or could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how heavenless and strong, it shall forever more endure the same.
Dear God, truly the poet that wrote those words was just like many others of your believers, searching, trying to find words to express it. That is written in the Bible. More because the preacher was wise, he sought out and set in order many words. Oh, how we would love to have the tongue and the vocabulary that we could explain to the people what it really is. But it could not be found on mortal lips. All eternity, doubtless, whether it'll ever reveal it, how that the God of heaven ever come to the earth to save poor, lost, wretched sinners. I pray thee, Father, that through these few unbroken words or broken words this morning, as I should say, that someone has found peace and a satisfaction and a strong consolation who's fled for refuge. And may their soul anchor to that promise which God swore to that He had raised them up at the last day. Several hands went up in the building right here in this tabernacle. God, give them that steadfast hope right now. May they anchor against the rock of ages. No matter how bad the sea may toss them, their little barks may jump, they have an anchor. The promise of God, there they stay. God said it, he can't lie. He that heareth my words, which I've tried to preach this morning, and believeth on him that sent me, Jehovah hath everlasting life, and shall not come to the judgment, but has passed from death to life. O oh, eternal one, bless those today. And may every person in here that's not under the blood, their soul, never been converted, May it happen just now, Lord. You work the mystery. It's all yours that's committed to you. I pray that you'll give it to them. Eternal life. May someday over on the other shore, as one by one we go down through the valley, may we meet over there where they'll never say goodbye no more. And someday we'll come to the river at the closing of time. When the last thoughts of sorrow is gone, There'll be somebody waiting that'll show us the way. Well, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. There'll be one somebody waiting that'll show me the way. I won't have to cross Jordan. All that's got that hope, raise your hand up now as you raise your head. I won't have... I just worship Him. The message is over. Aren't you happy? God swore He would. God swore He'd meet you there. Jesus died. All my sins to Oh, when the darkness hides. What do you say? The singer's gone. He'll be waiting for me. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. I'm, I'm forsaken and weary. Just worship you now. See. That my friends have all gone. Did you ever hit that place? But there's one that cheers me. What was it promised? My heart glad. I want to to cross joy. Now, children of the promise, just worship him for doing it. I want to to cross joy. happens now when the darkness I see he'll be waiting for me I cross Jordan when I come to the river Every one of these kind.
coming. There's a big dark shadow sitting there before you. It's a big door. You're going in there one of these days, maybe before the day's over. Maybe before church closes this morning, you're going in there. Every time that heart beats, you're one step closer. But when the darkness I see, he'll be waiting there. He said he would, he swore he would. That I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Oh, blessed Lord, our hearts are full this morning to the running over. To think of when the pulse is ceasing and the nurse presses a pillow around your head. And your hands, you can't move no more. Your hands is turned to ice. Your children, your mother, your loved ones are screaming and crying. That big door swings open yonder. You'll be waiting. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he'll be there. I won't have to cross it alone. When the sprays of the river begin to flash into her face, God will take the lifeboat, guide us right across it. He promised he would. David the prophet said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Lord, we are so happy today that we was included the heir of the promise. Today we have within us eternal life because we love the Lord Jesus and have believed Him and accepted His Word and His teaching. And He gave to us as a seal of our faith, the Holy Spirit. The seal of the Holy Spirit, our faith within us is anchored. And though many times we're walking through dark shadows, many times we're stumbling along the road, but our anchor still holds. There's something in it way yonder that seems to be guiding on, saying, move on. We're going on. God bless us. We need you. Keep us ever faithful and true until the time you come for us. We'll praise thee through the ceaseless ages. And that day when we stand on the earth, his blessed feet has never touched the earth yet. There he stands there in the air. And the saints and the redeemed from all ages do ever watch, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, all stand there robed in his righteousness. We crown him the King of kings and the Lord of lords and sing those redemption stories. Our poor hearts will quiver as we look upon him who loved us and gave himself for us while we were unlovable and sinners. Christ died that we might be saved. We thank thee for it, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. You love him? Oh, how real he is. Don't you just feel like you just like to just somehow put your arms around him? Wouldn't you just love to crawl up and touch his feet, you know? You know, we used to be some people come to my services in Phoenix, Arizona, and say, I'd like to talk it over with him. i like to say, Lord, you love me when my path got so dim. I just love to talk it over with him before we cross over. I, I want to see him. I, I, I just want to see him. To think how I'll feel, how my poor heart will quiver when I see him standing there. I've often wondered, I wish I could have heard that voice say, Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I probably never hear that literally like he spoke it then, but I want to hear him say this is the last day. It was well done. My good and faithful servant, I enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you. Since how long? Since you got saved? No, brother. Since the foundation of the world. When I saw you and foreknew you and our days in eternal life. You were blessed then. All that he hath foreknew he has called. Is that right? All he has called he has justified. 
Those who he has justified, he has already glorified. There you are. He foreknew us, called us, justified us, and we're already glorified with him at the end of the world, going to our reward. Aren't you happy? Amen. Sure, it make you love him. When you couldn't help yourself, and here he coming down that for you. Blessed be the tie that binds us to Gertie. Our hearts in Christian love. While we have this little fellowship of worship here now, and we're going to pray for the sick. God bless you. You raise your hands to Christ this morning. Find you a place to worship. Serve him. Now let's just worship him. Now as a congregation, all you Methodists, Church of God, Assemblies of God, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Catholics, all together now. Let's sing now. Let's be the Worship this morning. Take the word and plant it into the believers' hearts. May they not be just tossed about and up today and down tomorrow, but may these words find their resting place in every believer's heart. To know this, that God has sworn by an oath, and there's two immutable things of the immutability of God. That is that it's impossible for him to lie. That the heirs of this salvation might have this strong hope steadfast and sure, I anchor in the soul. To know this, that God has promised us by a sworn oath, one that he cannot lie, the other he has sworn oath on top of that, that he'll raise us up at the last day and give us eternal life. Knowing that after we have been called, that he said that he knew us before the foundation of the world and predestinated us unto the adoption of children through Jesus Christ. And he foreknew us, he called us, and when he called us, he justified us. We cannot justify ourselves, so he justified us by the death of his own son. Those who he has justified, he has already glorified. The word's already spoke, and we're just on our road.
going along rejoicing on our way to glory. Give people faith. And may the little habits and things that's hanging on to the people, may they shake loose from them this morning with this Word of God, which is an anchor of the soul, steadfast and sure. May they shake away from their habits, their little tempers, and the things that have been, as Paul said in the further part of the message in a few days, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does easily beset us, that we might run with patience the race that's set before us, looking to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, who was tempted in all manners like we are, yet without sinning. He was permitted to be tempted, but he did not heed the temptation. And we are tempted to sin, but never to heed, because the life that is within us is the anchor of our eternal destination, and we hold that sacred to our heart. Now there's many that Satan has afflicted with afflictions. We're fixing to pray for them, Father. May they, as they pass by under the Word of God today, that precious Word that's been preached, the Bible given witness, the angels of God standing near, and the great Holy Spirit above all is standing here to give witness to the Word. Now, Father, as they pass under the Word of promise this morning, may they go from here to be well, to remove their braces, to leave the chairs and and the cots that they lay on, and to just be made well. Grant it, Lord. May they return at the next service that they are permitted to come, or to their own churches, rejoicing, showing what great things Christ has did. This we minister for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I am to apologize for a promise that I made, that this morning we'd have the seventh chapter but I didn't get to it, and we have to allow a little time here for, uh, for, this, uh, for the prayer line. And now, tonight, the Lord willing, we'll take the seventh chapter and find out who this Melchizedek was. How many would like to know? Oh, we're just going right down to him. Find out just exactly who he is, and the Scripture tells who he is. See? And Schofield says it was a priesthood. How could it be a priesthood without beginning or end? <laughs> It wasn't a priesthood, it was a man. Melchizedek, a name, a person. Like, uh, not disregarding, but Christian science says the Holy Ghost is a thought. And the Bible said he, the Holy Ghost, and he's a personal pronoun, it's a person. Amen. Not a thought, it's a person. Absolutely. And Melchizedek is a man. A man who had no beginning of days or ending of years. He had neither father or mother or descent. And we'll find out who he is, the Lord willing tonight, by the word. Do you love it? Amen. Oh, thy word is a lamp unto my, uh, unto my feet. Amen. Oh. Now you say, Brother Bram, I don't understand it all, and neither do I. But one time I was preaching down in Kentucky, and to some of the newcomers, and Catholic and different ones, who may not understand how these deep, rich things of the Scripture. I've been preaching on divine healing, a little barefooted girl brought, she wasn't 15 years old, had a little baby, and it had the palsy. And I said, what's the matter, sister, with your baby? He said, it's got the jerks. She didn't know what to say, palsy. She didn't know what to call it. Little thing probably never had a pair of shoes on her life. Some man's darling, long hair hanging down. And I said, do you believe? And them little steel gray eyes looked at me. She said, yes, I, I sure believe. I took the little baby, and while I was praying for it, he quit jerking. <laughs> and it went out, went out. Next day, I was squirrel hunting over in the side of the mountain. I heard some man sitting there talking, old saw buzzing. And I slipped down. I'd been squirrel hunting. They was talking about it. And they sat there chewing tobacco and spitting the leaves of flying like that. And they were talking about now about the meeting the night before. And one of them said, I seen that baby. I went by there this morning. It isn't jerking yet this morning. See? So that was real. And he was spitting. And they had rifles leaning against the tree. So I thought I'd better make myself known. You know, they had feuds down there, too. So I walked up, I said, good morning, brethren. That great big fellow seemed to be speaking. He had a chew of tobacco in his mouth like that, way out on the side like that, and big long neck. And he had a great big old hat on, pulled down over his face. He looked around and see me. He reached up and got that hat, jerked it off, went, swallowed that chew of tobacco and said, good morning, Parson. <laughs> yes, sir. Respect. I'm not trying. I ever lived over it, I don't know. But he did. So the next night, coming back, there was a man there who wanted to argue with me a little bit. He went to a church that didn't believe in divine healing. So this was a Methodist church, White Hill, Kentucky. So he 
he uh, went to, he sang outside, he had a lantern in his hand. And he said, I want to say something, preacher. I just can't accept that because I can't see it. I said, you can't see it. He said, no. I said, I'm a sick man myself. I said, I just can't see it. I said, where do you live? He said, back over on Big Runnings. I said, well, how are you going to get home? He said, well, I'm going to walk home. I said, can you see your home? He said, no, sir. I said, it's awful dark and it's cloudy. He said, yeah. I said, how are you going home? He said, by this lantern. I said, the lantern doesn't show light all the way to the house. I said, how do you go? He said, I'll walk by the lantern. I said, that's it. You've got the light of the lantern now, and every time you step this way, the light will keep showing all ahead of you. If you just keep walking, the light will keep going with you. And you do that this morning. If you want Christ, the great high priest, the intercessor for your sickness or your diseases or your soul, you might not understand it. We don't, but we're commanded to walk in the light Amen. as he is in the light. You make one step in the light. And when you've got the light with you, the light will shine to the perfect day. It'll keep the path before you. And we'll walk up this grand old highway. Yeah. Telling you everywhere I go, I'd rather be an old-time Christian, Lord, than anything I know. Yeah. Ever hear that old song? There's nothing like an old-time Christian. Yeah. Christian love to show. Yeah. We're walking in the grand old highway and telling everywhere we go, I'd rather be an old-time Christian, Lord, than anything I know. I just love it. All right. Now, we're going to pray for the sick. We're not, we don't claim that we can heal the sick. If we did, we'd be telling something wrong. Every sick person in here is already healed. That's what the Scripture says. By his stripes we were healed. Is that right? Every sinner that's in here, if there happened to be one, you've been saved since Jesus died. But don't you never die here where your opportunity was placed before you to go into his presence and to try to accept it. It's made for now. Amen. Right now, you must accept it. If you go beyond the blood, then you're nothing but you're already judged because you're judged by the way that you treated the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, you're, You judge yourself there. So he was wounded for our transgressions, and with his stripes we were healed. So there's nothing I would have to heal you. There's nothing the church would have to heal you. The only thing we can pray for is this, that your faith will not fail, that you'll come to the altar this morning to accept Christ as your healer, as you did for your Savior, and without any... God works miracles. He shows great signs, blind, deaf, dumb, everything, are healed right here at the tabernacle. But whether it is or not, we accept it anyhow. Many times those things are about visions. How many was here about three Sundays ago or four when the man come in here both blind and paralyzed or sitting in a chair with a balanced nerve? And before I left home, I saw him in a vision. That there'd be a man there, dark hair, turning gray. His wife's an attractive-looking woman, about 60 years old. She'll come and be crying, and she'll ask me and to come back and pray for her husband. He sat right there. And I come down, I said to some of the brethren here, watch this. And when we went down to the altar, others had prayed. When I went to pray, I walked right away and come back over here. And his wife rose up and come just exactly the way the Lord had said it would be. People watching to see if it happened that way. It never failed. And so when he walked, come to find out that a man, Dr. Ackerman, down in Bird's Eye, Indiana, was the one who sent him up here, who is a Catholic. And his boy is a priest in a monastery there at St. Midas. And Dr. Ackerman is the hunting partner of mine. And he sent the man up here. And the Lord showed me a black-headed man that was sent him, but I didn't know who it was. And I said, was that Dr. Ackerman? He said, it was. See? And then the man, I said, it's thus saith the Lord. Walked down. I said, sir, stand up. Both blind and couldn't. He, the, the balance nerve was gone. He couldn't hold himself up. Like that. See? Been that way for years. Been to Mayo's and all around. Just prayed the prayer for him and raised him up. There he went walking down through. First he said, I can't see you. Then he screamed, yes, I can. His eyes come open. There, him being Orthodox, his wife Presbyterian. Some people think that Presbyterian don't shout in Orthodox. You already heard them. <laughs> sure. They were screaming and hugging each other. Come back, he got his wheelchair and walked on out and down the steps like any other man could see and speak and, and so forth. Had a letter from him. Remember, called the other day, I believe, Brother Cox and him and said, his eyes had a burning sensation. Certainly it's the nerve, the optical nerves are growing and coming back to life, you know, and taking its place. The curse was taken off. If you let nature have its way, if nothing hinders nature, 
then it'll, it'll have full sway. If you've got a band around your arm shutting off circulation, your hand will finally die. Now, because naturally it'll be all right if you just let it alone, but something's interrupted nature. Then if you can't see it, you no way for a doctor to catch it. Only two things he can work by, what he can see, what he can feel. That's the only thing he can work by, what he sees and what he feels. If he can't see it, then it has to be spiritual. Then his only thing and one thing can happen. We pray. Christ moves the curse, sends away the devil, and that begins to get normal. Well, gets well, and that's all there is to it. In my name, they shall cast out devils. Is that right? It's a promise to the church. It's a promise of power. And what? It, it's his presence with us. Now, what makes us from being perfect this morning to do those things just as he did is because we're still in the veil. See? But we have some feeling there that tells us, oh, yeah. See? And when you accept your healing, no matter what the veil says, it's what the word says. That's it. That's it. And the, the, the word always is predominant over anything. God's eternal word. Look at Sarah, her womb dead, 90 years old, lived with her husband since she was about 16 or 17, no children. Abraham, 100. God turned right around and gave him the baby. Amen. Because they believed, they called those things which were not as though they were. Enter that way this morning, friends. And tonight, we expect, if you all are visiting with us, we're happy to have you here this morning. And God be with you. If you're in the city for the evening, we'd be happy to have you this evening. Uh, on the rest of this service of Melchizedek. And then if you're not, and you have a church of your own, you go to your own church. That's that's your post of duty. If you belong to a church, you go there. This is this little tabernacle where we gather in here and have fellowship one with another. Now, the Lord bless you, and uh, Sister Gertie will play for us. The great physician now is near. And is there any here to be prayed for? Raise your hand. Those who wants to come in the prayer line, to put your faith to Christ. All right. If you line up on this side, of the church, if you will, and if they'll pull a seat down just a little bit, brother, if you will, so that we can uh, get a little room in there and can bring the folks through. Come over on this side, and we're going to pray now. While we sing, and I'm going to ask the elders here of any denomination of church, regardless of what it is, if you believe in divine healing, would you stand here with me on this platform to pray for the sick? We'd be glad to have you. Any denomination or no denomination, or whatever you are, we'd be glad to have you. Would you just come now for prayer? Come up and stand with me. Brother Neville, you'll come with the oil. 